We are coming uh, to the final two talks, and we have one of our content experts, Dr. Thomas Robinson, coming to the podium, and he's going to talk to us about energy-based devices. What is the evidence? Thank you very much, Tom, for coming. Yep, thank you, Gus. Thanks to the uh, Fuse Group and Pascal and Leanne for the invitation. I really do appreciate it. So. Let's look at the evidence-based medicine for comparing energy modalities. Uh, I do have disclosures. I work uh, teaching electrosurgery as well as studying electrosurgery, so I work, do work with some industry. So what we're going to spend the next few minutes doing is comparing ultrasonic instruments to bipolar sealing devices, and we're going to have a head-on-head -head competition here. We're going to look in the literature and see what the evidence suggests the differences between these two energy modalities are. There's a lot of literature out there. These are the studies that are benchtop studies, and there's a lot of clinical studies as well that specifically compare ultrasonic devices to bipolar ceiling devices. And so you have to really wade through this literature. And I just want to start by recognizing a couple of the limitations of this literature. I think there's three main limitations. The first one is the methodology is not standardized. Let's take burst pressures, for example. One study can measure burst pressure in another way and another study in a different way, and you can literally get two-fold or three-fold differences in the burst pressure with the exact same size vessel and the same generator and instrument. So you have to sort of look into this. The second limitation, I think, is there's an evolution of technology. And Many studies will take the latest generation of one energy modality and be comparing it to a prior generation of a different energy modality. And so you need to make sure you're comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges. Then I think the final uh, one is sponsorship bias. And manufacturers who make these devices support the studies, and this increases the chances of a conflict of interest. With this in mind, what I'd like to do is on the left side, compare um, uh, the ultrasonic instruments, and on the right side, uh, the bipolar vessel sealers. And we're going to go down these major clinical characteristics of these energy-based devices. And I think burst pressures, thermal injury, residual heat, uh, ease of dissection, and cost are some of the main clinical characteristics. So let's start with burst pressure, and specifically vessels smaller than 5 millimeters. So what is burst pressure exactly? You know, burst pressure is used as a surrogate to say how robust is the seal that's created by this energy-based device. And so literally what happens in a burst pressure is you inject fluid, or could be air, into the blood vessel, and you watch and see when the vessel, when the seal ruptures, and you get a pressure. In general, pressures that are three times physiologic, or the FDA has 360 millimeters of mercury in mind, are considered the, the lowest that are acceptable. So let's look at studies that specifically look at blood vessels smaller than five millimeters. The first one I pulled was one out of uh, colon tissue after it was excised. This is human uh, mesenteric blood vessels uh, from the colon mesentery. The average size vessel was 1.1 millimeters. So if we compare the bipolar devices to the ultrasonic devices, both seal way above physiologic levels, so above 1,000 millimeters of mercury. And they're similar. And so I think the conclusion or the conclusion of this study was that both ultrasonic and bipolar devices are adequate for sealing one millimeter blood vessels. Now let's take a little bit of a step up and look at blood vessels that are sort of three to four millimeters. So this was uh, blood vessels sealed in an anesthetized pig. And you can see I have three different bipolar devices here made by different manufacturers and then an ultrasonic device. The size of the blood vessel is in the first column and it ranged between around three and a half to four and a half millimeters. There was, and then finally we have uh, burst pressure over here. And you can see that the burst pressure for the ultrasonic device was around 400 millimeters of mercury, which was statistically not different than bipolar device number two or bipolar device number three. These are all well above physiologic blood pressure. 
it is notable that one of the three manufacturers bipolar device did have higher ceiling pressures, but if you think about what's clinically relevant or physiologically relevant, I think all of these devices made the cut. And so I conclude for blood vessels less than five millimeters in diameter that bipolar vessel ceiling devices and ultrasonic energy uh, devices are equivalent. Now let's look at uh, ceiling vessels that are the diameter is six to seven millimeters, so a little bit larger blood vessels. I think there's two good studies in the literature. The first one was from 2003, so it's really with a prior generation of devices, so I didn't include that. This is the more recent one that I looked at, and so it's sealed porcine or pig blood vessels. The size was five to seven millimeters, or five to seven millimeters, just like we talked about. And what they said was, look, if the seal pressure, the burst pressure is less than 300 millimeters of mercury, we consider that an immediate fail. For the bipolar device, there was no immediate failure, so none of the vessels sealed with a burst pressure of less than 300 millimeters of mercury. And this was really in contrast to the ultrasonic devices, where the newer generation of ultrasonic device, about one in five, were considered immediate failures, and for the older generation, about one in two were considered immediate failures. The 2003 article that looked at five to seven millimeter blood vessels had the same conclusion. And so we're gonna say for vessels six to seven millimeters that the bipolar vessel sealing devices are superior or clinically better than the ultrasonic energy devices. Let's shift gears and look at thermal damage or thermal spread. So the first thing we have to do is define what is thermal spread. And so typically what thermal spread is considered is, so you use your um, energy-based device to seal a blood vessel. There's gonna be thermal injury along the blood vessel adjacent to the instrument tips. And so it's typically histology is used to measure how wide is that thermal injury or the thermal footprint of the device. So the first study we'll look at is in an anesthetized pig, the blood vessels were sealed, so moderate sized blood vessels, three and a half to four and a half um, millimeters in diameter. And we have here the bipolar sealing devices and the ultrasonic sealing devices. Here's for the arteries and here's for the veins. In both cases, the bipolar sealing device had a wider, had more thermal damage in comparison to the ultrasonic device. So a little bit over four millimeters thermal damage for arteries. Uh, and less than one millimeter for the ultrasonic device, and it was similar for the veins. Let's look at a second study, and we're going back to the study on the uh, colonic mesenteric blood vessels. And once again, it, this study compared the bipolar device, the thermal spread, compared to an ultrasonic device. Once again, the conclusion was the same, that ultrasonic devices have less thermal damage in comparison to the bipolar uh, tissue sealers, and I think one of the former presidents of SAGES had a comment in a uh, commentary, and I'm going to quote, the bipolar sealing device caused significantly more thermal damage to the sealed vessels than the ultrasonic device. This finding was identical to the data reported in numerous previous studies, and I think that statement does sum up the literature. And so when we look at thermal damage, I think ultrasonic energy has less thermal damage and so clinically, it's the superior energy modality from this standpoint. Residual heat is the next topic, and we've touched on that a little bit in, in a couple of the previous talks. So let's define residual heat, and then let's look at uh, the evidence behind it. What residual heat is, is, okay, I activate the device, and after the activation stops, the tips of the device are still hot, and then if you were to touch additional tissue, the heat in that's residual after you've activated the device could potentially burn that uh, extra tissue. And so this is data from a study that Henry Govacar, one of our residents, so we published this and presented it at last year's SAGES meeting. We did this on the bench top, and what we did is we tried to replicate a real clinical scenario where the instruments were activated for five seconds, and then they were off for five seconds, activated for five seconds, and off, and we did this for four cycles. At the end of the fourth cycle is time zero. And you can see on the x-axis of this graph, time zero is right here. And then we waited certain amounts of time and we touched liver tissue. So we waited two and a half seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds, and 20 seconds. Then we would touch additional tissue 
and see how much the tips of those instruments raise the temperature of that additional tissue. And the increase from baseline temperature is over here on the y-axis. What we found was that when you compare an ultrasonic device to a bipolar tissue sealing device, that the ultrasonic device at all time points increased the temperature of, additional te of the additional tissue more in comparison to the bipolar device. There's a similar article that Dr. Kim published, and the same finding came out of this article as well. And the conclusion is, look, bipolar vessel sealers have less residual heat. And so bipolar vessel sealers are clinically superior in comparison to the ultrasonic in instruments from the standpoint of residual heat. All right, we got two more to go here. The ease of dissection is a little bit harder to get at, and I'm going to dance around this in a couple papers, and I'm going to quote a couple papers. So the first paper I'm going to quote is just how long are the cycle times? So this is sealed in vivo in an anesthetized pig. We've got the blood vessel size is around three and a half to four and a half millimeters, and they're all the same size. And then we have the speed of the seal. So you can see that the speed of the seal was shorter for the ultrasonic device, a little bit over three seconds, in comparison to all three of the bipolar devices. And you can see there's a range of the length of the seal times for different manufacturers bipolar devices, anywhere from four seconds to eight seconds. And these are all on similarly sized blood vessels. The next paper I'm going to quote for ease of dissection is the plume, or how much smoke comes from the devices. And what this study looked at was the smoke and vapor particulates, and this is in parts per million. So as we learned earlier, actually, the ultrasonic devices don't make smoke, they make steam. And you can see that there's less particulates that are generated from an activation of an ultrasonic device, so there's less plume. This is in comparison to all three manufacturers' bipolar tissue sealing devices. And again, so what I'm trying to get at is ease of dissection, and it's a little bit hard just from these just strict uh, quantitative studies. And so I'm just going to quote a couple of papers in the literature because I think when you read this literature, it really does come out. Quotes like this, ultrasonic instruments facilitate the dissection phase of the operation. Here's another quote comparing grasping between ultrasonic and bipolar tissue sealers. Bipolar tissue sealers are poorer graspers, unlike ultrasonic devices. And you can find these quotes in the, dis in, in the discussion sections of multiple papers just suggesting that there's an ease of use and ease of dissection with ultrasonic energy devices. And for this reason, I'm going to give the nod on the ease of dissection to the ultrasonic instruments. So I think the ultrasonic instruments are clinically superior to the bipolar vessel sealing devices. The final category is cost. I think it's hard to get at cost. I, I couldn't get at it from the literature, and so I just asked at uh, the hospital that I work at, hey, how much do you buy the various hand pieces that we use here in the operating room? On the left side, I have ultrasonic instruments. Uh, at the University of Colorado, there's one manufacturer that sells us various hand pieces of ultrasonic devices, and they range from $400 to $500. Two different manufacturers supply bipolar vessel sealers to our hospital with m a multitude of hand pieces, and they range from $400 to over $600 per hand piece. So I averaged these, and the point estimate was 525 versus 483, and I did a, a t-test assuming unequal variances, and there's no difference between those two numbers. I was actually surprised, but I think the conclusion is that the cost in my hospital system is similar between ultrasonic devices and bipolar vessel sealers. So briefly, just to run through this, we looked at burst pressure, which is a surrogate for how robust are the seals that these instru instruments make. Burst pressures are similar for less, vessels less than five millimeters, and the clinical edge goes to the bipolar vessel sealers with the larger vessel size. For thermal damage, I think ultrasonic instruments are clinically superior. In terms of residual heat, I think bipolar vessel sealers are superior. For ease of dissection, the nod goes to ultrasonic instruments, and cost was equal. And I think if in very broad strokes we could say one sentence that would compare these two energy modalities, I'm going to go to the discussion of a paper, a clinical paper, comparing ultrasonic 
and radiofrequency bipolar tissue sealing devices for colectomies. And this paper basically said, look, each modality has its strengths. They have different characteristics. Ultrasonic instruments facilitate the dissection phase, whereas bipolar tissue sealers have better hemostatic power. And when you look at the literature and the evidence-based uh, approach to comparing these two energy modalities, I think this is a pretty good summary. My final slide just is, look, in the final decision, there's pros and cons to each one of these energy modalities. And what you need to do is say, huh, what's the anatomy that I'm considering in my operation? What size blood vessels are, for instance? And then finally, what am I familiar with? Which ener energy modality and which hand pieces do I understand the most? So with that, I'd like to thank the FUSE group for the privilege of presenting. Thank you.